very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, tonight we have a review of Solvency II, has it met its objectives? And that's by the retrospective on Solvency II Working Party. So in terms of introducing tonight's topic, we have an official opener, so I'm not going to say very much, except that uh, it's been a long time coming. May 2001, the European Commission first started uh, considering Solvency II. And uh, what's that? Uh, 15 years later, we've, we've finally got there. Uh, I still personally think it's very much unfinished business. So this is a very, very timely paper uh, from the, the Working Party. So thanks very much to them for what I think is a very well-written paper. However, I'm now going to introduce the opener, Mr. Craig Turnbull, uh, who's with Standard Life Investments. Uh, after a 15-year career at Barry and Hibbert, where he was head of research and advisory, overseeing industry-leading work in insurance, asset liability modelling, economic capital, solvency to, and the hedging of insurance liabilities. At SLI, he leads the insurance solutions team, which works closely with the, the global insurance client group to support insurance asset management. He qualified as a fellow of the Institute and faculty in 2003. Thank you very much, and we look forward to your opening words. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much, Gordon. Uh, first and foremost, um, I'd like to congratulate and compliment uh, the Working Party on their excellent paper. I think their conclusion that Solvency 2 represents a significant improvement over Solvency 1 uh, without fully achieving all of its goals, as I expect one that most of us uh, would feel comfortable endorsing tonight. I'll attempt to briefly range over some of the main topics covered by the paper that reflect this caveated conclusion. And the limitations of time mean I must be very selective and I will highlight what I think are some of the poor paper's most important and interesting points for actuaries and also where, in my view, um, there are areas where further actuarial research uh, may prove very useful. Sections two and three of the paper provide a comprehensive survey of all the aspects of the design and implementation um, of Solvency II's Pillar 1 that should be important to life actuaries. This alone, I think, makes the paper a very valuable resource uh, for practicing actuaries. Even those immersed in Solvency II are likely to have found some new and useful facts um, amongst their commentary. I, for one, was surprised when reminded that IOPA estimated that the removal of the volatility adjustment uh, mechanism in, in, in Solvency II uh, would reduce Solvency coverage ratios by some 85 to 90 percent in northern continental European nations uh, such as Germany and Denmark. The Working Party's discussion of the implementation of Pillar 1 also highlighted areas where the outcomes do not appear actually intrusive, if you like, or where they could give UK actuaries reason to pause for thought. For example, are actuaries entirely comfortable with the idea that under the matching adjustment rules, uh, the total asset requirement um, of a matching adjustment book, i.e. the sum of its liability valuation and capital requirement, can be virtually unchanged when its bond portfolio is switched from gilts to triple B rated corporate bonds. Another example of a potentially counterintuitive outcome uh, could be the requirement for non-matching adjustment business, such as with profit funds, to hold gilt swap spread capital to support their gout holdings, which seems especially unreasonable if and when swap spreads over gilt are negative at the valuation date, which is indeed the case um, in recent times. The Working Party highlighted the UK life industry's long-standing concerns uh, with the required levels of complexity in Solvity 2 internal models and with the burdensome nature of its documentation and its governance requirements. The party did not, however, speculate on how this state of affairs might be improved upon. This is perhaps an interesting area of future actuarial research, um, i.e. what does a good principle-based capital assessment system really look like? Is a more efficient and effective system uh, than the current one possible? This might be a timely discussion to have. It's clear that since the global financial crisis, uh, many global influential thought leaders have expressed some scepticism about giving financial institutions uh, the latitude to assess their own capital requirements. Um, certainly the case that principle-based capital assessment uh, does not have the same sort of in-vogue status 
it had back in 2001 um, at the initial inception of Solvency 2. And Solvency 2's current implementation of principle-based capital assessment is arguably not helping to garner further support for it. Section 4's discussion of the impact of the matching adjustment rules on new to business highlighted some of the currently significant asset liability management topics uh, for those businesses and their actuaries. The Working Party noted the significant shift in MA asset portfolios from corporate bonds into less liquid assets and the industry's intention to continue to increase these asset allocations. Other working parties are currently specifically focused on the matching adjustment um, and on private credit investing, as Gordon mentioned uh, a moment ago. I'd agree these are certainly areas worthy of further actuarial research and that it raises interesting new actuarial questions. For example, in the context of illiquid liabilities such as annuities, is there an actuarially desirable limit on the proportion of assets held in illiquid assets? What are the long-term potential sources of demand for asset liquidity for such business and how might they behave over the long term. The paper noted in section 5 that liquidity management and stress testing is part of Solvency 2's Pillar 2, but it's also arguably an interesting area of broader actuarial asset liability management research, and one that may be increasingly relevant for other actuarial fields, such as defined benefit pensions, as they become increasingly net cash flow negative. I felt the discussion of pro-cyclicality in section 4.2 of the paper was, was one of the papers, sort of uh, the jewels in its crown, if you like. Um, the issue of pro-cyclicality, I think, requires difficult judgments to be made and the trade-offs that may arise between the objectives of policyholder protection on the one hand and supporting our broader financial stability on the other. A general point I'd like to make here on this topic is that really any form of risk-sensitive capital measure, and uh, not only market-consistent ones, have a basic tendency to be pro-cyclical, as indeed uh, there's really any financial risk management form. If the basic quality of the assets relative to liabilities deteriorates for any given reason, as a consequence there will be less capital available to support risk, and it will also usually be more risk. If the capital assessment is risk sensitive, either risk must then be reduced, or more capital must be found if a given level of capital coverage is to be maintained. When market values are used in one way or another in risk-sensitive capital assessment, as they have been by actuaries since the Maturity Guarantee Working Party of 1980, if not before, then some pro-cyclicality is inevitable, and its degree is really governed by the extent to which it's felt reasonable to assume that market price changes are driven by essentially risk premium changes as opposed to changes in expected cash flows from the asset. And that logic really applies uh, whether the asset is a corporate bond, an equity holding, or indeed anything else. Now, the empirical evidence support the hypothesis that variations over time in market risk premiums are a significant driver of financial market value behaviour has been increasingly well documented by economists over the last 40 years or so. It was also a fundamental feature of the Wilkie model approach used in maturity guarantee reserving and elsewhere by British actuaries over that time period. In the context of one-year market value VAR, as embedded in Psalms 2, such a view can be captured by essentially dampening the asset fall stresses that are assumed following falls in asset values. The working party suggests that such a dampener approach could be applied to all forms of financial market risks in the Solvency II value at risk calculation. This is quite consistent with, with, with the above, but it does of course raise the important question of how to calibrate those dampening mechanisms and really whether such calibrations can be delivered in an objective and reliable way in the context of the tail probability estimates um, and validation requirements and so on that really drives on to the capital requirement. Finally, in the paper's tabulation of the historical use of regulatory flexibility for insurers in various European countries since the start of the 21st century, I was somewhat surprised to see the working party did not suggest uh, that Solvency II's current parameterizations of the last liquid point and the ultimate forward rate for the Eurozone should be included. The current assumed values for these parameters seem to me to be the straightforward departures from objective assumptions that have been made in order to support the regulatory solvency levels of life firms in northern European countries, thus avoiding prompting significant management actions such as de-risking or capital raising. From that perspective, it might be argued that the Working Party's award of 3.5 out of 5 on the question of whether effective risk management across Europe has been achieved uh, was slightly generous. These comments were intended to stoke discussion and highlight further avenues of potential research for the profession. 
I would like to again thank and congratulate the Working Party on the delivery of a valuable paper and open the discussion to the audience. Thank you, Craig. I would now like to introduce uh, the Chairman and two of the members of the Working Party who are here tonight. Uh, Dick Ray is the Working Party Chair. Uh, he is currently uh, at head of the BMO Global Asset Management UK insurance solution business. Uh, prior to that, he spent over 14 years in investment banking, focusing on asset liability management, strategic asset allocation, and for a short period was uh, CEO of Abbey Life. Welcome, Dick. Uh, he's joined by Andy Pelkovitz, uh, who prior to 2007 was with Sun Life, AXA Sun Life, and then uh, laterally moved to HBOS, which became part of the Lloyds Banking Group as head of capital management in its European business. He then moved to Germany and became head of actuarial and investment business in that business, uh, which uh, later transferred to Heidelberger Leben, where he was deeply involved in the implementation of Solvency II for insurers in Germany, Luxembourg and the UK, so very wide-ranging mix of experiences. And they welcome. And last but not least, Michelle Trottay, uh, who is uh, our principal advisor in KPMG's life actuarial team, having joined from Prudential UK, where she was closely involved in the development of Solvency II internal models, particularly for the with profits business, including calibration of their proxy models. Since joining KPMG, she's worked on a large variety of engagements on financial reporting, in finance transformation, uh, large-scale projects involving both IFRS and Solvency II. Welcome. So, Dick, Andy, Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for attending this evening's uh, presentation and discussion. Um, and Craig, thank you as well for your insights, which uh, are very valid and, and very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here at the Royal College of Physicians, and I put my Ray Tartan tie on, especially for the occasion. I hope you appreciated it. Um, but uh, for the last 18 months, our working party has been conducting this review and asking the question, has Solvency II actually met its ob objectives? Um, and as Gordon says, I'm joined here with uh, Andy and, and Mashari, who's, who's going to go through the paper for you. Um, there are, in fact, um, six members of our working party to whom we're indebted. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, their contribution, along with Chris Barnard. He was our um, shadow, our Life Research Committee member shadow, um, and he participated as well. So I'm thankful to all the hard work those people put in to make this paper um, possible. Uh, and our working party has drawn from the experiences within the team, which include investment banking and asset management, consultancy, life practice, as well as experiences from Ireland, Germany and the UK. Our first actions back in January 2016 were to hold two meetings, one here in Edinburgh and one in London, to determine what our retrospective on Solvency II should look like. And we decided that we would take a broad-based generalist approach. And in doing this, uh, we decided that we'd assess and evaluate Solvency II against its original objectives, which include improved consumer protection, effective risk management, harmonisation and financial stability. And then back in October last year, we were able to seek the view of actuaries um, that attended a workshop that we held at the LIFE conference, and their feedback certainly helped inform the paper. So any of you that had joined any of those meetings, I'd certainly like to thank you for your contribution. As I say, we decided not to take selective deep dives, and there are other working parties not uh, doing that. Craig mentioned the matching adjustment working party. There's one on transitional provisions. Um, and I'm also conscious that within this room, there will be specialists amongst you who within your area will certainly know more than we do on the subject um, that, that, that interests you. And if it does interest you to form a working party uh, and to find like-minded professionals or, uh, uh, within the profession to, to join you, then um, certainly you know, a range of topics have been suggested by Craig, and we highlighted some in the paper, namely the issues that we see around discounting, the various approaches there are to the risk margin and um, 
the design and application of a counter-cyclical buffer risk, not just for equity risk, but for all market risks. Um, this evening, Andy will cover um, Pillar 1, market consistent valuation, as well as, uh, and that includes the risk margin um, and capital requirements. Mishali will cover the uh, impact on behaviour, Pillars 2 and 3, and harmonisation. And finally, there is Brexit, which I will briefly mention here. Um, when we started, we certainly hadn't uh, bargained for Brexit, nor the resultant Treasury Select Committee um, inquiry into EU uh, legislation for insurance companies. For our working party, we're, we were fortunate enough to be sufficiently advanced to provide an input into the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries response. With the onset of the election, this inquiry has actually been disbanded presumably to resume again with the formation of a new current uh, government, albeit without its chairman, Andrew Tyree, who will not be standing for re-election. There are two huge concerns over the impact of Brexit um, and what it will have on the UK's ability to compete within Europe in the insurance sector. Post-Brexit, we will lose all influence over future changes. And given the importance of the of insurance regulation, to, uh, uh, the, sorry, the insurance industry to the UK, um, and the need that the EU has had in its past to exert its influence, the Working Party does not think um, it makes sense to adopt Solvency II post Brexit without that influence. Rather, we think it makes sense to adopt um, a parallel set of uh, regulations along the same lines. And this actually gives the UK the opportunity, a better opportunity, in fact, than the rest of Europe to um, fashion solvency to and address the issues that we see in it and, and highlight in our paper. However, in respect of any changes, passporting and equivalents, retaining those are a major concern. And these are big issues and issues that are actually solved at a political level. Um, and certainly, you know, that's true of other examples of compromise, such as Omnibus 2 and the equivalents of other uh, regulatory regimes. With Solvency 2, we have a hugely impressive regulatory regime that provides a standardised framework more extensive than we have seen before. In drawing our conclusions, though, despite all its achievements, our findings are that when you look at the outcomes in details against the goal set, Solvency 2 actually falls quite far short of what it sought to achieve. Now, you could argue that this is harsh given how far it has brought the industry within Europe, but it's only right given the huge sums of money that companies have invested in it that a critical appraisal takes place. Some issues are teething problems, whilst others are more fundamental. Our paper serves to set these out whilst putting them in perspective of Solvency 2's achievements. And on that note, I'll hand over to Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, as Dick said, I'm going to describe sections two and three of the paper. Section two is about market consistent valuation. Solvency 2 started with the intention of being market consistent. It was later recognised that for long-term business in particular, changes were needed to make Solvency 2 acceptable to the member states. And these changes have departed from market consistency. The question has been raised as to whether market consistency is a desirable end in itself or merely a useful tool to ensure a consistent approach to valuation with little need for judgment. I think it's fair to say that within the working party we don't entirely agree on the answer to that question. Uh, section 2.1 is mainly about departures from market consistency um, and I'm going to talk briefly about the three listed there. The ultimate forward rate, the, the risk-free yield curve used in Solvency 2 is based on interest rate swap yields. However, for long terms, swap markets are not deep and liquid and the curve is extrapolated to the UFR. For the euro, the extrapolation starts at year 20, which seems to have been a political compromise. 
The curve converges to the UFO of 4.2% over a period of 40 years. The UFO is less of an issue in the UK because the, the swap market is deep and liquid for longer. In the current low interest environment, EOPA has already suggested a lower UFO than 4.2%, even though that rate was determined not so very long ago on the basis of long -term, stable long-term assumptions. Next item is a matching adjustment, which is in addition to the risk-free yield curve, uh, and it can be applied to portfolios of liabilities and matching assets subject to very stringent conditions. At the start of 2016, this was being used only in two countries, 15 insurers in Spain and 23 in the UK, uh, where it is applied to portfolios of annuities. And Michelle is going to say more about the uh, matching adjustment later. Volatility adjustment is in addition to the liquid part of the risk-free yield curve. It aims to protect insurers from market volatility. At the start of 2016, it was being used by 852 insurers in 23 different countries. Um, and um, the opener made the point correctly that it's very significant in certain countries, particularly Denmark and Germany. So these three adjustments also raise the question of whether the risk-free discount rate itself is too conservative for insurance companies. Uh, we believe as a case for using a discount rate that reflects a good investment rate, perhaps a double A or a single A. So most participants in, in our survey that we carried out at the LIFE conference were in favour of departures from, from market consistency, but within the working party we, we do have a difference of opinion on this subject. Moving on, section 2.2 of the paper is about the very topical issue of the risk margin which is part of the technical provisions. Risk margin is a cost of capital and is defined as the amount another insurer would require to cover the full cost of capital for non-hedgeable risks following a transfer of liability. The risk margin has recently been criticised on the grounds that it's too sensitive to interest rate movements, but also that it's too large. It's also not stressed in the calculation of the SCR uh, which means that if you hedge the interest rate risk in the risk margin, it increases the capital requirement, which seems perverse. Um, furthermore, it's complicated to calculate. It usually requires approximate methods. Very long time ago, when Solvency II was in its early stages of development, and I was a, probably a comparatively young man, uh, Two different approaches were considered for the risk margin. There was the cost of capital approach, which is, was being used in Switzerland. Uh, and there was also the difference between best estimate and 75th percentile liabilities, which was being used in Australia. It seems from this um, uh, consideration that a key driver was the wish to retain a prudent margin above the best estimate liabilities rather than a specific desire to include the cost of capital. It's been questioned whether the cost of capital approach, which enables recapitalization, is too prudent for insurance companies. So there will be a review of the risk margin. The EU is carrying that. Uh, the EOP is carrying that out for the EU. Uh, the starting point, we believe, should be a reassessment of its purpose. The paper presents a number of our and other commentators' ideas for improvements to the risk margin. Quite a wide range of them. They, they vary from. Uh, changing parameters, for example, the cost of capital rate is defined as 6%, which seems very high. Uh, and at the other end, something completely different, or indeed doing it away with it altogether. Um, as I said, there's a number of ideas. We, we believe that they could be of relevance either to the review within Solvency 2 or to a UK review post-Brexit. Section 2.3 of the paper relates to transitional measures. These were packaged and negotiated as a political response to issues which were in the way of final agreement to Solvency II. They're presented as providing an orderly transition. 
There are several of these. The most significant is the transitional measure on technical provisions. At the start of 2016, 154 insurers in 12 countries were using this, 28 in the UK. It runs off the difference between the Solvency 1 and the Solvency 2 technical provisions determined at the end of 2015, linearly over 16 years. The Solvency 2 technical provisions include the risk margin, so this measure effectively smooths in the introduction of the risk margin. In the UK, the base position is normally the ICA, so the initial adjustment is li likely to comprise mainly the risk margin and the restrictions to contract boundaries, which were brought in with Solvency 2. In countries that use the passive Solvency 1 valuation method, and Germany is a good example of that, it also allows for differences in the discount rate and differences in other valuation assumptions. The regulator may require, or an insurer may ask for, a recalculation of this measure where the risk profile has materially changed, or after 24 months. The PRA expects a recalculation every 24 months and has set out what it considers to be material changes. These include changes to interest rates. The PRA review process for this, however, appears complicated, time-consuming and slow to respond, and we would welcome a simpler and more responsive process. Our paper also covers the other transitional measures, which I won't go through here. Section 3 of the paper is about capital requirements. Section 3.1 is about the standard formula. This is used to determine the SCR for insurers which don't have an internal model. It's particularly suitable for small and medium insurers and insurers which are not subject to specific or unusual risks. About 92% of life insurers in the EEA are using the standard formula. Life insurance must value up to 17 separate risks, each of which has its own rules, written in completely different forms, ranging from very simple to unnecessarily overcomplicated. The paper gives an overview of how the standard formula is calculated and describes some of its many peculiarities. And we include suggestions for improvements. It also gives examples of risks that are not included. Standard formula companies must assess annually within the also the own risk and solvency assessment, which Michelle will be covering later, uh, whether the standard formula assumptions are appropriate, allowing for the risk profile of the company. This assessment is a significant burden on small insurers. Insurers must consider how to address significant deviations. Guidance suggests the solutions, developing a partial or full internal model, de-risking or aligning the risk profile with the standard formula, which feels to me like tail wagging dog. However, these solutions may be impractical. Furthermore, the regulator may impose a temporary capital add-on following this assessment. Section 3.2 is about internal models. Insurers may use a full or partial internal model to calculate the SCR rather than the standard formula subject, of course, to regulatory approval. I said earlier that 92% of life insurers use a standard formula, so only 8% are using internal models. The PRA had approved internal models for 19 groups by the end of 2015, and a few more since. This is a significant proportion of the European total. The PRA was an enthusiastic supporter of internal models, in particular, it held a pre-application process, which allowed both the regulator and insurers to prepare for the formal application. We see the use of internal models as broadly positive. It enables insurers to model their risk profiles more accurately than the standard formula and encourages insurers to take responsibility for managing risk. However, as indicated by Craig, there are some criticisms burdensome governance and documentation, non-level playing field against the standard formula, supervisory influence on and benchmarking of calibration, which is arguably contrary to the logic of any internal model uh, and encourages herding, and over-complexity. 
Our working party believes internal models are too complex. However, there was a broader range of views in the survey we carried out in the LIFE conference. And I was interested in Greg's comments on uh, internal model, the, the idea that allowing an internal model is um, not so fashionable as, as it was, and um, maybe there might be a trend in, in the other direction. Finally, section 3.3 is about other economic capital models. An insurer with an existing economic capital model before Solvency 2, or with a different internal view from the prescribed Solvency 2 methodology, could use another model alongside Solvency 2 for other purposes other than solvency valuation. However, this may bring ad added complexity and even confusion. So although some insurers may wish to use an alternative model in managing the business, others may conclude it's of little practical value. We've already seen that some insurers have ceased reporting embedded value as an example of this. And now I'll pass over to Michali, who will describe the rest of the paper, including what Craig described as the jewel in its crown. Thanks, Andy, for that. I think we've been referred to Michali quite a few times, so now is probably a good time, a good time to start talking. Um, so, as Dick mentioned, um, I'll be covering uh, sections four to six of the paper. Um, and to start with, I'd like to explore um, the, the coverage of our impact on behaviour, which covers three key areas. Um, the first being in section 4.1 around asset liability management. Matching, sorry. So what has Solvency 2 brought in terms of its impact on ALM practice for insurers? On the positive side, um, we've, had, we've got a regime that generally rewards us for matching assets and liabilities through a reduction in the Solvency caps requirement. Although, as with everything, there's always an exception, and the most notable being the risk margin, as we've alluded to earlier. In the UK, such a practice has been prevalent within with profits funds since the introduction of the realistic balance sheet in 2003. The main ALM change as a result of Solvency 2 has been a move to a swap space discount rate, which has triggered um, a review of the ALM practice um, for those that are running their funds, assuming a guilt rate. For German insurers, there is a trend to extend the duration of their assets um, so as to reduce the exposure to interest rate risk. In practice, the trend in Germany has been gradual. Because of the transitional arrangements, the ultimate forward rate to some extent, and the fact that the downwards interest rate shock in determining the SCR is small when rates are low. For annuity business, introduction of the matching adjustment has had a huge impact on ALM behaviour. Eligibility rules have introduced a shift away from traditional asset allocations, such as corporate and government bonds, to high quality illiquid assets. Some previously favoured illiquid assets, such as equity release mortgages, um, have had to be securitised internally, and with that comes extra cost and resource. According to the statistics, 25% of annuities are currently backed by liquid assets, and indications show that that's likely to increase to up to as much as 40%. In part, this is also driven um, by the search for yield in the current low interest rate and falling, yield, uh, falling credit spread environment. No doubt this also brings positive economic outcomes uh, with greater investment from insurers in areas such as infrastructure assets. Finally, even for unit-linked business, an ALM practice of moving away from matching the face value of units is one that is closer to a best estimate li liability reduces capital requirements. So this too has certainly changed the dynamic of ALM behaviour in some shape or form in all corners of Europe. Moving on to section 4.2, um, it's our second area around pro-cyclicality, which has been, been mentioned by the panel already. One of the impacts of Solvency 2 um, that raises concerns is the pro-cyclical nature of market consistent approaches and questions are being asked about the going concern approach under Solvency 2 compared to the runoff approach under Solvency 1. Market consistency will tend to be pro-cyclical. If markets fall, it makes sense for us to hold capital against further falls. But as those markets fall or become more volatile, under the one-year value-at-risk approach of Solvency 2, insurers either have to find more capital or sell. This essentially requires them to de-risk in the same time frame as other institutions. 
And underlying all of this are three key facts that we already know. We know that markets can overreact. We know that many are not deep and liquid. And we also know that insurers writing long-tail business don't have immediate cash flows to pay. So to evaluate the potential solutions, within the paper we've explored various methods to achieve a more desirable capital regime, touching on, for example, the symmetric adjustment for equities in the standard formula, with the potential to extend this to other market risks, and dealing with short-term volatility through countercyclical buffers. In conclusion, our concerns around pro-cyclicality were echoed by our live conference audience last year. A capital regime that provides time for insurers to formulate a measured response would be desirable and bring SONC2 closer to meeting its objectives around achieving financial stability. Moving on to the final area of section four um, around product design and consumer protection. So Solvency 2 has increased the focus on risk capital, the use of capital, and capital steering via the use test. To evaluate the full costs of holding risk capital, we have to consider the capital intensity for each product over its full term. In this section, we explore how insurers can improve profitability over capital intensity. We look at the impacts of various options, ranging from redesigning products to accelerate profit emergence, to promoting protection business to, to bring diversification benefits. There are clearly pros and cons of each of these approaches, um, but there is certainly evidence of more activity across various insurers evaluating both the products under a Solvency 2 world and also asking questions of new ones. It should be noted that transitional me measures, as mentioned by Andy earlier, do not apply to new business, and capital requirements are higher than under Solvency 1 for long-term guaranteed business. This is an area of potential concern, given that competition is not a primary um, focus of the PRA. To conclude, we recognise that there is increasing pressure on companies to take a more customer-focused view, and ideally one would hope for material positive impacts on conduct risk from Solvency 2. The desire is to help reduce reputational risk and future mis-selling, and I know everyone in this room doesn't want to see another mis-selling scandal. Time will certainly tell on how insurers um, will factor in all of this into their Solvency 2 ca calculation of risk capital. Moving on to section five, uh, we move away from pillar one and assess the remaining two pillars of the regime. Section 5.1 sets out agreement between our working party and votes cast at the LIFE conference that pillar two has been a major success of Solvency 2. Section 5.2 explores the requirements and reviews the ORSA uh, and the publicly disclosed SFCR. The ORSA certainly has the UK's DNA running through it as it is similar to the ICA regime we knew before Solvency 2. However, Pillar 2 has raised the bar considerably compared to the Solvency 1 regime. In general, the ORSA, although an onerous process, is seen as a useful risk management tool and a best practice approach to embedding a strong risk culture. The SFCI is being publicly disclosed over the current quarter for the year-end 16 results. This includes further detailed uh, information on the Solvency to Summit C2 position, and it may actually cause companies to revise their disclosures in the future, so quite an interesting time. Section 5.3 covers liquidity, um, and this is mentioned by, by a few members of the panel already. Since the financial crisis, the risk of liquidity has assumed a much greater concern for regulators, and recognition of that liquidity risk is another positive outcome of Summit C2. A feature of the UK life insurance market is that most with profits funds are in runoff, and they're at a time when they'll pay more out in claims than they will receive in premium and investment income. So liquidity planning is clearly important. For annuity portfolios, UK insurers, cash flow modeling and matching has been a long-standing practice. Liquidity and the posting of cash collateral makes liquidity a bigger uh, issue for insurers using derivatives, especially those that are long dated. Overall, there is greater emphasis on liquidity risk in Solvency 2, but we do know it doesn't include any quantitative measured or, or measures or prescriptive liquidity ratios, as you'd see in the banking regulations. Our view is that the principles-based approach is appropriate in the context of long-term insurers, given that liabilities are illiquid and long in duration. However, we note that this could give risk to variations in rigor and practice across Europe. Section 5.4. Um, explains, explores the final pillar of the regime, which has introduced greater transparency across Europe in terms of reporting and greater public disclosure. 
From a UK perspective, though, Pillar 3 disclosures has meant a loss of some of the granularity that we would be used to seeing in the PRA returns. In that respect, one could argue that there is less transparency. Just to put this all into context, uh, for solo undertakings with no ring fence funds, there are potentially 68 QRTs, of which 13 are required quarterly, and of some of them being publicly available. Naturally, this volume of disclosure brings some common issues like the granularity of reporting, so something like the asset look-through, the volumes of data that we're dealing with, the speed of reporting, just to name a few. Interestingly, an increasing number of QRTs that are publicly disclosed doesn't automatically mean that those disclosures go far enough. As we've seen, there's no formal requirement to disclose the impact of the UFR on technical provisions. Analysts are fully aware of this, and there's certainly a view from the capital markets that they're looking for voluntary disclosures from insurers in this area. In conclusion, the working party's opinion is that certain parts of the detailed reporting do not appear to justify the costs and the efforts of both the insurers and everyone involved. Parts of the supervisory disclosure is too detailed and onerous, and we actually question the value that it brings to the regulators. Of course, a post-Brexit world would give an opportunity to evaluate the relative merits of the current disclosures and for the purposes of the UK insurance industry. And finally, the final area of the paper is section six around harmonization. On the face of it, the detail of the regulation and the introduction of a common European regulator has resulted in a high degree of harmonization. But when you actually take a deeper look it, ha it actually reveals important areas in which harmonization has not been achieved. And these can be summarized in three key groups. Discretion, gold plating, and interpretations. Psalm C2 allows supervisors to exercise discretion in some areas. And we've seen examples of this in, through reporting exemptions, the approval process for the volatility adjustment, and capital and add-ons between member states. The general view of both the working party and members of the Life Conference workshop was that Psalm C2 has been gold-plated in the UK. But it's difficult to find concrete evidence to support this. It could be justified, in theory, as a difference in interpretation between our industry and the regulator. Overall, the working party also struggled to find conclusive data on whether the internal model approval process in the UK was more difficult than those from EU regulators. But we know that this question is highly subjective in nature and difficult to accept, assess given the conversations in private between the insurer and the regulator. In conclusion, the Solvent C2 has imposed a sophisticated, detailed and revolutionary set of rules across 28 member states, which should be commended as a major accomplishment. However, despite this, our view and that of the voting audience at the live conference was that Solvent C2 had failed to achieve harmonisation. Thank you for listening, and I hope that our whistle-stop tour of the paper gives you a good overview of our work to date, and uh, we really look forward to some discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Andy and Dick. Uh, just about to open the discussion to the floor. Uh, just before I do that, a reminder, the meeting is being recorded, so please state your name clearly before making your contribution. Also, we do have roving microphones, so if you could please uh, uh, put your hand up, um, make yourself, um, uh, make us aware of who you are and uh, speak into the, the microphone. Who would like to <laughs> kick off? One of the fronts, <laughs> M Mr. Hare. Thank you very much, Gordon. Uh, thank you to Dick and the authors of the Working Party. Uh, paper. Um, yeah, my main preparation for this evening was responding to a request from Dick by email to be ready to say something if nobody else said something. Uh, but having sat where Gordon is sitting and had long silences, uh, which I've had to fill, uh, I've taken pity and I'll do my best to, to prompt some discussions. Though I think Craig did do his best with some of his stuff and maybe having the, the opener before we hear from the speech maybe puts it too early in the agenda and we've forgotten the points. Um, I must confess I've not read every word of, of what looks like a very stimulating paper. Uh, I have looked through it, though, and uh, found it interesting. What I haven't been able to find, though, has been any reference to the Sharma report, and maybe that's because I've missed it, but to me, I think Psalmacy 2 has to be read through the eyes of the Sharma report, which um, 
was a one of the there was a first paper before Sharma. There was a paper by I think Muller about solvency, and then there was a paper by Sharma, which was what were the what's the toolkit that regulators would need uh, in the new solvency two environment, and they were starting from the perspective of studying a lot of case studies of what goes wrong in life companies, and they looked at lots of case studies across Europe of failures and near failures of companies. Now, Gabriel Bernardino was a member of that working party, chaired by Paul Sharma of the FSA in those days. And they came up with a startling conclusion that life companies get into trouble not because of capital, but because of what management do. Hence, all the strong pillar two insights. And so I agree with you that it does bear the marks of the FSA, but that's only because, or the UK, but I think that's probably mainly because the UK were in the middle of bringing in their ICAS regime anyway, and they were able to do that. Um, but I think part of the problem is that when we talk about Pillar 2, we talk about a different capital requirement. Whereas actually what Solvency 2 means by Pillar 2, colloquially, I think, is a regularly supervisory framework that requires the company to understand their risks and then gives the regulator certain powers uh, of intervention. And I think one of the things that I chair the, the working party of the AAE that's developing the standard for the actuarial input to the ORSA, and one of the issues we've come up, about, uh, come up with is whether we should actually discourage people from using a different capital requirement in the ORSA, because of the ORSAs, all about the ability of a firm to meet its technical provisions and its capital requirements in the future. What's the point of being able to meet another measure? What does that tell you? Um, so you'll see when the ESAP 3, in fact, has been out for consultation several times, and those of you who've looked at it, which might be a small set of the audience here, um, you'll see that we actually imply that you need to have a very good reason why you wouldn't use the Solvency 2 balance sheet for ORSA projections, given the purpose of the ORSA. Uh, though I do know of some companies that would much rather look at a different balance sheet, uh, though what that tells them about their resilience uh, to regulatory requirements, I'm not quite sure, but some people are still wedded to the old ICA approach. But I think where I'm going with all of this is that, to me, one of the key points of Solvency 2 was trying to encourage people across Europe to understand their risks, and that's the best security for policyholders. In fact, capital is not the best security. Capital is what you've got there when everything else has gone wrong. And I think that may be a way of looking at the risk margin, because I think uh, Andy is right. I remember being part of the Treasury uh, negotiating team support. Uh, the, Treasury nego had a, the, the negotiators of the UK had a support team uh, drawn from a number of different actuaries, and for some reason I ended up in that room. Um, and uh, so one of the things that was being tried with the risk margin was to essentially find how much more do you need, because I think it had been deemed inappropriate to have only the best estimate left when everything else goes wrong. You want to have more than that in technical provisions. And in fact, the IFOA have had uh, research parties, a fair valuation working party looked at this many years ago. I think that you and I were on a working party that looked at it as well. Um, and I think the general feeling amongst actuaries is you want more than best estimate there when everything else goes wrong. You want a little bit of a buffer. But how do you work that out? And you either do it as a probabilistic thing, as Andy was explaining, or you have this other method, which actually the industry proposed, what I find quite amusing, with the benefit of hindsight, is the industry so upset about the risk margin, but that was an industry idea, as far as I can tell, came from an industry group. Uh, it got squeezed into, I think it was either Quiz 2 or Quiz 3. A lot of the industry who had been pushing the method didn't actually put results in on the method because they weren't able to do it, but yet it was still pushed. So to a certain extent, we have what, what we as an industry pushed for here, uh, but I don't think anybody realized what would happen to the risk margin when discount rates went so low as they have gone. So this is, this is a bit rambling, but I think if people want to talk about why the, what the, the key question I think for the risk margin to me is, if you're going to try and have more than best estimate, how much more do you need? And the Fair Value Working Party, they based how much more do you need on how much you need over the remaining term of the, of the contract, and then we were asked when we presented our results to an, uh, a faculty session or meeting, but how much do you need now? Don't you need a current hurdle? And we hadn't developed a current hurdle. 
So it's a, it's a bit like a pension scheme. You know, what's the current hurdle? Is it the funding basis? Is it the buyout basis? And actually, it probably doesn't matter quite so much to customer security if there's a protection scheme in place, provided it's an adequate one. And interestingly, we have a policy order protection scheme in place in the UK. I'm not sure where we've got to in the European-wide one. Um, but actually, I personally feel that there's been too much attention paid to Pillar 1, and that's not the industry's fault per se, but actually we seem to have forgotten the importance of Pillar 2, which is how we got to this position in the discussion. And I wonder whether there's something about redressing the balance might be helpful. The other question which I would like to pose is around Pillar 1. Again, and that is, and it's about the capital requirement. And what I'm not really sure about is um, why the internal models that people have today need to be so much stronger than the ICA models were that we had for the last 10 years. And has our understanding of risks been so lacking in the past that we need to hold more capital against those same risks now? Or is that an element where there could be some element of discretion uh, and maybe some more public debate about what is enough to hold? Because I think some of these issues, we will, my favorite quote, or one of my favorite quotes is, um, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And um, I think our chasing after a perfect capital model uh, maybe is, is a fruitless task. What we want is an adequate capital model uh, combined with the other features of solvency too, because after all, we're trying to give policyholders the best outcome that we can give them. We're trying to give them security over getting their benefits, and for some types of contract, we're actually trying to add value to them. And if the capital requirements stop us adding value or stop innovation, then we have to ask if that's a a, a question, you know, is that a helpful consequence or have actually we gone too far? I realize those were slightly rambling thoughts, but you did ask me uh, to, to give some opinions. But I'd be interested if people have any, particularly, I think one of the key things is, you know, how much is enough in the technical provisions? Once you've burnt through the capital, how much do you want to have left? Because if we can get an answer to that, I think that will help to drive some of the issues that I think you've rightfully raised. And the other plea is, let's make the ORSA work and work as a long-term projection. And don't think of it as being a replacement for the ICA, because it's not. It's something much more holistic, and it gives actually a wonderful opportunity to show that we can explain complex risks to boards in a way that they can take action on the back of it. That is no mean challenge and no mean feat to achieve it, but I think if actuaries across Europe can do that, then we've, we've positioned the profession very well for the future and serve the public interest admirably. Thank you. Any reaction to that or any other contributions from the floor, please? Mr. Clarkson. Thanks. Partly doing this because Jim Black doesn't want to be in video, but now he's going to have to be. But there you go. So my, my name's Alistair Clarkson. Uh, I, I swore that I'd never talk or think about Solvency 2 ever again in my life, having spent so much the last 10 or 15 years doing that. Uh, here we go again, so thanks very much, Dick, and all your colleagues. It's uh, great to be here, be chatting about it again. Uh, is Solvency 2 more effective regime than Solvency 1? The answer to that, I think, is clearly yes. Does it more effectively reflect and reward good risk management? Yes. Uh, has it been worth the three billion quoted in the paper uh, for its implementation in the UK? Well, certainly not in my opinion. Uh, I think there's, D David touched, touched on culture and the or aspects relating to risk culture. Uh, I think if you go and ask a lot of senior people in life companies or presumably GI companies at the moment what they think of Solvency 2, they'll say lot of money, lot of time, lot of resource, lots of very detailed technical discussions. I have to pretend I understand. And actually, I do wonder, with, well, I don't wonder, I think we've spent an inordinate amount of time discussing how we should technically measure risk as opposed to actually understanding and managing risk. Uh, one aspect worth touching on, it's been touched on already, level of documentation required. Again, my view, uh, well, clearly some documentation is necessary. But the extent and the amount we've got at the moment, I think, is just well beyond the value add. 
uh, maintaining that on an ongoing basis is not going to be cheap and is a significant challenge. And I do wonder whether it provides a false level of security uh, about the level of understanding of the risk and actually reduces the ability of people to identify and be aware of the key underlying assumptions. I think while someone can maybe pick up that documentation and reconstruct a model, I think whether they could pick up that documentation and actually explain and understand the model in simple terms is a, a whole different question. Uh, this is all going to be very positive. Internal models, which people who know me will be so surprised to hear about. I think the concept of internal models uh, makes, you know, make, makes sense in theory. If a company is willing to uh, use a model to make business decisions, then why shouldn't it be able to use a model to calculate its capital requirements? Uh, I think the reality we've found is very different and I've, I have some sympathy with the regulators here of the, the extent of the apparent discomfort they have that that comes through when you're discussing internal model approvals. Uh, I mean, you can sort of imagine the scenario, a company runs out of capital, oh, who decided how much capital it would hold? Oh, the regular decided it could hold its own, use its own model to calculate its capital. So effectively, the regulator decided the company itself could decide how much capital it wanted to hold. I'm, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but you can sort of envisage how you might end up going down that line. And how much time and money has been spent across the industry for internal model companies where we all spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours working out models to come up with an equity stress of 39% of whatever it is. Uh, or longevity improvements or whatever. It's become a game of guess the quantitative indicator, how far does the bar have to be raised? Uh, my mind, having a pillar one based on a specified set of stresses, which achieved a significant part of the benefit of Solency 2 without a lot of the cost and sort of mental trauma we've all gone through. Don't intend to cover any of the detailed technical aspects that have been discussed already. I'm sure there are people much more qualified than me to do that. Um, only note, it's not surprising that, as the paper notes, a poll amongst actuaries suggests there's no common view on the issues of preferred solutions. Uh, basically, that just confirms there isn't a single right answer. I think effort, for me, would be better focused going forward and more effectively managing risks and capital requirements given the regulatory regime that we have. At the end of the day, regulators want to ensure companies hold sufficient capital to meet their liabilities with a given degree of certainty, we want to be able to identify emerging problems in time to be able to address with minimal disruption, and actually within that context, level of capital and security, the specific regulations to drive that will always ultimately be a political and regulatory compromise. Uh, and I think the balance needs to be struck between theoretical accuracy, practicality of application, and the overall level of capital. You know, again, to me, I'm not convinced Solency 2 has always got that balance right. Having said all that, uh, we now have Solvency 2. It's an improvement on where we were. Should make the most of it and actually manage our business effectively in that context, make its ongoing implementation as efficiently as, as efficient as possible. In particular, process for managing changes to internal models should be made as efficient as possible, and care should be taken that we don't spend inordinate amounts of time refining and refining and refining very detailed bits of the technical model that make diddly squat difference to the actual capital hell. I'm not sure how you'll spell diddly quat and badge, but anyway, we'll find out. Anyway, thanks again to Dick and the authors for their paper. Thank you, Mr. Clarkson. Any other contributions from the floor? I've got one or two observations. As uh, Mr. Hare mentioned, it's always the job of the chairman to have a list of questions just in case it's uh, unaccountably quiet. Um, yeah, picking up Mr. Clarkson's point, um, there's you know, almost three layers of Solvency II. There's the, the basic rules and the regulations. Second layer you could think of as the interpretation of those rules and regulations. Uh, but the third layer, and I think one that seems to cause a lot of angst amongst actuaries I speak with, is almost the, the governance around that. Uh, not just internal governance with uh, 
model governance committees and boards, that sort of thing, but uh, particularly the point that Mr. Clarkson raised about uh, the reapproval process. Most actuaries I know want to spend much more time actually using Solvency II, thinking of uh, you know, product strategies, pricing strategies, uh, optimizing hedging, uh, reassurance strategies, that sort of thing. But they're deep into snagging lists for internal models, uh, uh, transitional measure reapprovals, matching adjustment reapprovals, uh, etc., etc. Uh, it's absolutely not a, a well-honed process. And uh, internally within companies, but also specifically within the regulator, there needs to be a lot of work making these processes far, far more slicker so that actuaries can actually get on and uh, use the models. I'd be interested if there's any uh, you know, nodding of heads or shaking of heads around the room. What's, uh, what's your company's uh, experience in that? Any thoughts? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, one more point on, uh, on models. It's quite interesting that uh, as a life assurance industry, as an insurance industry, uh, we are, of course, developing uh, more and more complex models uh, due to the regulation. Uh, I particularly enjoy uh, the discussions on copulas, uh, trying to pretend we uh, can observe enough one in 200 year events to, uh, to truly understand what diversification is in uh, a 99.5th percentile. Uh, slightly bitter comment, probably because I don't understand the maths anymore. I don't think it was invented when I was at university. Uh, more serious point though, uh, in terms of internal models, just as we're uh, pushing ahead with them, you see the banking industry, for example, rowing back from them. So they are now stepping away from using internal models for operational risk and are moving back to a, a much, much simpler series of, of factors at the same time as uh, the regulator is pushing for increasing complexity and increasing documentation and uh, governance around, uh, around that aspect of internal models. So uh, there are some interesting, uh, interesting things there. We've probably got time for a couple more observations. Uh, any from around the table? Perhaps I can respond to some of the things that Alastair and, and David have said. Um, uh, I was interested by what you said, David, about Pillar 2 and the fact that maybe it should be oriented about being able to meet future solvency requirements, if that's what I understood correctly. Um, and I think... You know, one of my concerns about a regulatory regime, and I don't know how far you go, but the more and more you make it granular and prescribe capital requirements, so there's all this latest thing about, oh, we've reduced the capital requirements for infrastructure debt by 30%. Um, those capital requirements drive increasingly investment behaviour, for example. And so... Uh, you know, the PRA in, in some of the, the, the latest speech, I forget who it was by, so I won't say now, but, um, uh, you know, they're almost acknowledging the fact that their regulation is driving behaviour. And I don't know if that's a good thing, necessarily. It doesn't feel like a good thing to me. But I don't know how you can avoid it, because if you... I mean, ideally, I'd like to see insurers be a little bit more grown up, less precision more common sense and trying to do the right thing from an investment point of view, for example, on ALM, rather than being driven by the, the capital rules. And I don't know if that was maybe Alistair, something you were talking about, you know, the fact that we just make things more and more precise throughout the, uh, the process. Um, the risk margin, I think you touched upon, um, David, uh, and I think I've kind of gone full circle. When I, the initial rationale is that, you know, you've got enough risk margin, you've got enough... Uh, the, the liabilities are what it would cost for someone else to take on your balance sheet if you fell into trouble. And certainly, in my days in m and you used to look at the risk margin and you used to discount that and come up for a value for the cost of carrying capital. That was always an adjustment to the price. Although, when I realised that what we used to do there, we certainly didn't discount it at a risk-free rate. And certainly, I know that Cameron Farugi has done some papers in the past about what could be the correct approach to, to risk margin. I think I've probably gone a little bit full circle in that, you know, maybe the risk margin is just this thing, it's just extra capital that you should hold because it kind of makes sense to. Um, and certainly, when you look at matching adjustment and your front end in all the illiquidity premium 
um, uh, in which case if you invest and match those liabilities, all the liquidity premium that you're getting off of your assets are reinvested in order to pay those claims suggests that somewhere you need to know that you've got a little bit of room. Okay, I know it's the best estimate liability, but somehow it doesn't quite feel right. And I do wonder whether, you know, a risk margin based on a, a, what is it, a 75% are we saying in the paper, something like that, does, does in fact make sense. And, and Alastair, I, I, I sympathise with you, <laughs> not wanting to talk about Salt 2 again. It reminded me of uh, Spike Milligan when he wrote Pacoon. He said, I swore I'd never write another book, this is it. Um, on my part, I swear I'll never do another session of paper. <laughs> Thank you, Dick. Probably a good time for one last contribution uh, before I invite the uh, Robbie microphone down the front here, please. Um, one thought I had on Solvency 2 was one of the potential outcomes from it has been insurance companies seem to be so focused on capital and make, making their products as capital efficient as possible that effectively the insurance industry seems to be turning into an asset management industry and seems to have kind of lost sight of the word insurance um, in, in its title. So f from my perspective, I think that's, you know, unfortunate for, for the sector, but it's just an observation. Thank you, Roger. Um, probably no invite, unless there's any last minute uh, requests to speak. Uh, invite, oh, down the front, please, Ms. Mr. Eastwood. Just save my thunder until you were ready to wind up, Gordon. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, Adrian Eastwood speaking. Um, just a point from the standpoint of management of closed with profits firms, which I see quite a lot of these days. Um, the, the risk margin there seems to cause particular difficulty. And, and one thing I'd say about risk margins generally is it's not, not just the, the risk margin and the capital requirement, but actually the way things are managed, companies want to make sure that they've got plenty of coverage for their capital requirement on top of the risk margin. And when you add all these things up, we, yeah, in theory, we must be sort of one in 5,000 <laughs> chance of not having enough in the kitty at the end of the day, which seems to have gone too far. So I think you have to think about whether the risk margin is right in the context of the way in which companies manage these things in practice, which is to hold a buffer over and above their, their capital requirements. Then when you come to apply all of that to a series of close with profits funds, if you have got some risks in there that are very difficult to hedge uh, or lay off, then you end up uh, potentially significantly compromising the pace at which you can share the, the, the estate out. Um, now, it's not necessarily the wrong outcome if you've got the risks, the risks that, are, that are genuinely still there, but it does rather concentrate the mind, I think, of the companies that they've got to find imaginative ways of getting rid of those risks. And maybe when actuaries come out of this ever-refining internal models thing that they're focusing on at the moment, um, we, we might see a bit more of a, an appetite somewhere for, for some of these difficult risks to be taken on by people that have got access to the, you know, the right capital and, and taken out from with profit, closed with profits funds where it's not really the right place for those thorny risks to be. Anyway, it's just an observation. Thank you. And we've got one time for one final contribution, please, from Mr. Duffin along the front row there. It's not surprising from this audience that most of the discussion has focused on life assurance. Uh, although I would uh, support uh, Adrian's comments about the difficulties for with profits funds in operating with, the, with this difficult balance be between distributing and uh, governing the pace of that distribution as opposed to holding uh, additional capital. But uh, there are also general insurance businesses uh, which are uh, very much affected by Solvency II. And that's a more difficult area altogether. There isn't the same publicly available data to make comparisons. Uh, general insurance companies hold their own data very jealously. They may specialize in a variety of different areas, making comparisons even more difficult between companies. And indeed, the, the uh, 
as well as the regulator uh, in this area, the auditors play an important part in trying to maintain some level of consistency in reporting. And the regulator and the auditors will sometimes get together or appear to get together to try to see what the consistent picture is. And it's sus suspected that the main tool that regulators use is to try to compare different um, practices by looking at the outcomes companies are reporting for different types of different lines of general business. This does have some benefits, on the other hand, uh, which is worth mentioning in, in, in passing. At board level, we will have a variety of people sitting around a table, very few of whom will be familiar with how to calculate the details that they're seeing, the reporting, going into their Solvency II reporting. But the outcomes are quite important because it allows boards to make comparisons between different strategic options. To some extent, this was always possible, but it, 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 it is um, more mechanical now within each company to make these comparisons. And I think that does help a better standard of reporting and therefore better standard of decision making at board level. But I suspect the weakness of the system, uh, and I don't have an easy answer, I think it's intrinsic, is that the, because of the greater level of discretion in general insurance business, regulators will try to make comparisons themselves and push companies to, into uh, different reporting practices from those which they would have thought of for themselves. Within a sealed state a member of the, of the European Union, that may not be such a bad thing, but we have 28 states at the moment, coming down to 27, and there is no sign to the observer that there is any harmonization going on between regulators, particularly in the general insurance field. And I think uh, that's a politically difficult thing to organize, and therefore I suspect it won't happen for a long time, but I think it is a weakness in the system. Thank you. I'd now like to briefly introduce our closer, Jonathan Pearce. Jonathan has spent his career with Standard Life, and he is currently their chief actuary. Jonathan. Thank you, Gordon, and uh, thank you very much for the uh, raft of late contributors. I was worried for a minute I might have to uh, improvise for 45 minutes on closing comments on uh, summarising the, uh, the debate so far. Um, I'd like to start by joining tonight's other contributors in uh, congratulating Dick and the Working Party on their comprehensive, clear and engaging paper. Um, the subject is wide-ranging and the authors have succeeded in both the breadth of the work and the quality of the comments and suggestions they've made. And I think that's been reflected in the, uh, the kind of wide range of, of comments that people have had on the, the paper this, this evening. Um, I'll briefly um, draw together a few themes. Um, there appears to be fairly strong agreement with the authors that the risk margin, particularly the volatility of the risk margin, is uh, a source of concern and that a review of the design is, is needed. I was interested in David's comment that actually the industry asked for this, uh, this form of, of, of risk margin. Um, as the authors note, Solvency II permits um, a number of simplifications um, in calculating the risk margin. And it's interesting that it is um, the more complex and in some senses accurate um, of these calculations that actually suffers from, uh, from the, the problems of, of, of extreme sensitivity to interest rates, which does suggest that a focus on actually what is the purpose of the risk margin and how big it should be and on simplifying to achieve that um, is, is perhaps the, uh, the right way forward. Um, in addition to the points noted today, I'm aware of a further issue with the risk margin for unit link contracts for standard formula firms. Um, the combination of the very strong mass lapse stress which the authors um, bring out together with discounting at a very low rate can result in a risk margin um, and a, as a cost of capital which hugely exceeds um, the SCR. Um, and indeed the, the value of profits on the contract. So you then end up with a very sort of non-intuitive behavior where actually if persistency um, assumptions, your view of future in persistency improves, you end up with a deteriorating solvency position. Uh, so this I would add to the, add to the, the, the kind of issues um, highlighted. 
Um, the second theme I'd like to focus on is market consistency and risk management. Um, I agree with the authors that Solvency 2 is a significant improvement over Solvency 1. Um, there were direct conflicts under Solvency 1 between um, short-term solvency considerations and sensible uh, risk management actions, uh, for example, hedging of guarantees. The authors express the view that it is through market consistency that effective risk management is rewarded and imply that a number of features of Solvency 2 detract from this. I mean, it's certainly the case that the example that they give of the fast extrapolation to 4.2% um, UFR in euro, um, if kind of literally taken to drive risk management, um, would you know, result in uh, a disincentive to, to, to manage those risks. And I was particularly interested um, in Craig's comments at the beginning that he saw this as a temporary sort of political intervention in the in a line with removing the resilience test and 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 so on. I mean my, my view in this area is that Whatever the regulatory regime, um, there is a need for actuaries to consider their view of the actual risks and make this the primary um, driver of risk management. And David's comments on the ORSA, I think, uh, uh, you know, aligned to this. Um, this then needs clearly to be balanced against the need for an acceptable position um, from a regulatory position. Um, and I would comment that the balance, um, from my perspective, is much easier to achieve under Solvency II than it was under the under the previous regime. Um, perhaps the most important area uh, of the report is the impact of Solvency II on procyclical behaviour. And it was striking the vote of the Life Conference, um, which was pretty overwhelmingly that um, Solvency II has not aided financial stability. Um, a number of procyclical features of Solvency II are highlighted in the report. Um, including the risk, um, clearly, that in distressed markets, as well as the impact of uh, market fall, you're then hit with um, trying to calibrate your liabilities and your 1 in 200 stress in illiquid and volatile conditions, and that could itself drive, um, you know, kind of further, further significant um, constraints. In addition to the points listed, I would also highlight the risk of over-reliance on target solvency ranges or probabilities of breaching the SCR. Um, too rigid use of such targets could amplify the inherently pro-cyclical features of the regulatory position. Um, so in benign conditions, um, the pro-cyclical nature of, of a risk-based capital could result in um, apparently very high solvency ratios or very, very low probabilities of default um, and therefore encourage de-risking, uh, return of capital and so on. Um, if conditions then deteriorate, um, the, you know, the kind of increase in risk in these conditions will very quickly contribute to, a, um, you know, to an even more procyclical uh, behaviour. Um, so I feel that the management of this volatility is an area where actuaries have a lot to add and does illustrate the importance of not being over-reliant on models um, or the regulatory position in managing, managing risk. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank the authors again for their stimulating report, which provides both an excellent point of reference and also a starting point for clearly a number of further areas of work. Thank you, Jonathan. It uh, only remains for me to express my own personal thanks to um, uh, both the offers, the, the working party, the opener, the closer, and to all those who did participate. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, one final point, very helpful for those who did speak, if they had prepared notes, if they could make them available to the staff, that would help with the transcript of the, the meeting. So uh, I think that's it for tonight. So meeting closed. Thank you all.